let's take Doha. Yeah. World Athletics Championships. Yeah. What What did you think were your your personal headlines from it? Quintessentially, what I think Doha was about, and it's an interesting case study, uh, and one that we need to think a little bit more about because I'm rather bored with going to sort of cosy sports congresses. In fact, I don't go to them very much any longer, where everybody, if they want to get a cheap clap, stands up and says, we've got to globalize sport. We've got to take it to places that we haven't taken it before, and we need to impact and imprint on young people, and there's less physical activity in the world than there's ever been. And then when you do, um, journalists rush to TripAdvisor and The Guardian tells you that they're not that keen on the human rights in that country. All perfectly and reasonable positions to take, but you then have to make a judgment about the bigger picture, that this is a market your sport needs to be in, and yes, you can't be, uh, you can't ignore some of the political constraints and challenges that come with that, but if sport based itself, based its relationships, on transient and political situations, then you wouldn't have international sport. But that's not to say that you don't sit down at the end of a championship and go, right, you know, we had far too many empty seats in the first two days. Why was that? Why did that happen? And, and interestingly, the empty seats became, and it was an interesting, I found Doha really interesting, and I guess it's the politician in me, that I'm sitting there and both press conferences I went through, there was very little discussion about the fact that these were, by athletic performance, the most successful world championships we'd ever had. Eight championships records, 21 continental records. Define a global sport better than 49 countries winning medals uh, at a world championships, and some of them for the very first time. So on that side, the sport is moving forward and there are newer and fresher sponsors and they've all decided that reputationally we are not the bet that we were four years ago. But the real challenge of course is that the case for the accused now in sport is actually quite a serious one. I noticed the other day the ECB were getting hit quite hard for uh, having a snack food yes, the, title all sponsor. The different crisps for the but, uh, and, the, and the NHS led that charge. But actually, I found the globe slightly wobbling that every time, once I've paid an egregious charge to park my car to go and see someone in hospital, uh, I then get a sale by Starbucks and Costa in, in, the, um, in the lobby. And I've got you know, the NHS telling sport or companies that are prepared to spend this, to dedicate discretionary spend to sport that is actually going to keep and help people moving. It's the best vehicle we have. Uh, and then to have a discussion about calories and not outputs. So we are all, and particularly in sport, in a much more complex environment. And 30 years ago, nobody would have challenged me on any of those things. Now there are, I've got 20 micro disruptors out there. So my questions in Doha were not about Dina Asher-Smith or, or Hassan or Brazier. I was being asked, you know, I got questions from Amnesty International in the crowd, um, you know, ILO, um, you know, government commissions, agencies. So that is totemic of every organization now. You are, you know, you have more technology to do so many more things and far greater legal constraints in order to do them and you're and everything is turbocharged through you know fiber optics dishes social media and we're all here for shorter periods the, the iwf was founded in 1912 i have five predecessors one of them only did seven years so the average tenor is 31 years in, in the fortune 500 in in 1980, there was only a 5% chance that your company would fall out of the top 500 in five years in that sector. Last year, it was roughly 45%. CEOs last three, four years, you know, whereas you're never going to see the Vengas, the Ecclestons, the 
Ferguson's, Ferguson's mm. the bladders any longer because you're just not going to be there that long. So you have to, all organisations are going to have to learn to accelerate relationships and make things happen at a far greater speed than they were in the past. Obviously, you're, you're, you will stay with World Athletics for, for as long as you can, noting that it might not be 31 years. Um, but No, well, I've changed the terms, of course, so, so I can't do that. So, so how long? We've commuted it to three terms. So nobody can sit there for more, uh, most 12 years, and I'd okay. be very surprised if I did 12 if, years. Okay. So what, what do you want to achieve within that? Do you see that as your primary role? And indeed, what do you set yourself goals and targets and go, right, in the next 10 years, I want to do this? When I became president of, of the sport, we were, I set a target of being a top four sport, not Olympic sport, because that's, an, that's a meaningless, you know, everybody... I've stopped everybody talking about us being the number one Olympic sport. Of course we are. The Olympic Games starts when we start. I mean, it's... No, that's not true, because I present swimming and it starts before. <laughs> OK. I think the Olympic Games starts with the opening ceremony, Seth. I just wanted to. Mm -hmm. Wind me up. Of Thank course. you. But, so I, I set, ourselves, set ourselves a target of being a properly, on proper metrics, a top four sport. When four years ago, we were on a good day, eighth, on a bad day, ninth. We've now moved to five. And there are three sports all within one percentage uh, of each other. That's uh, basketball, tennis, and swimming. And we will move ahead of that in the so next So football's couple. number one, is it? Football number one. Um, and this is in terms matter. of recognition, profile? This is in terms of profile, profile recognition. Investment? Uh, yes, investment, uh, sponsorship, uh, revenue streams. Um, and we have the advantage, of course... And I, I think I can say this without fear or favour. We are one of only two truly global sports, football and athletics. Tennis is getting quite close, but there are large parts of the world yeah, that don't play don't, tennis. But right. we are 200, you know, we had yeah. 214 nations compete. No, 213 in Russia, in Doha. Um, and so that that's, that's, I wanted to set a target and I think we can get there. And then we've got to cement ourselves in there and we've got to create better partnerships globally in the public sector because that's those are the people that will build our stadiums and taxpayers money so we can't we have to be much we have to be politically savvy about how we sell the sport and I don't want the sport just to be sold as a sport we have one massive massive asset and that is that more people do in running more people do what we do than any other single uh, physical a activity. There are, in the space of about oh, two and a half weeks, over a billion people identify themselves as leisure runners on the planet in one way, shape or form. Uh, and that's a huge, huge asset to have as a sport. And that's, I'm, I'm not surprised, but that's why Wanda came on board the other day for a, to, for a 10 year sponsorship deal with us to take all our Diamond League um, events for and, and media rights for 10 years. So uh, we're moving in the right direction and I want one day meetings to look entirely different. They've got really tired. Our world championships are too long. 10 days is not where most people's heads are. Television sport really actually whatever they say they don't like weekends anymore. That's rather cluttered. So I want to see us get down to sort of five or six days uh, and evening only sessions. We sort of road tested that a bit in Doha and I want to see the athletes earning more money unashamedly. I mean even with Usain Bolt we rarely got anybody into the top 50 um, most marketable people in the sport. We've now got three in the top 50 and Dina has just crept into the top 10. Well, I th you see, Dina's a, a fact, I mean, I'd love to I'd do a whole hour just on Dina Asher-Smith and the power that she might have to, to change attitudes and, and change a lot in this country, but she's the hottest property in British sport, yeah. bar none. She's number one. She's the one that people want to pay the big money to. And I'd love her. I really want her to do well, so, to, to, and to, obviously to have people to give her good advice to manage her money, but to actually really make a... I wonder, I wonder who that but might to, be. To really make a... a, a, a you know, to, to re, for her life to change yeah. in the way that footballers we've never even heard of can do in a week. 
seemingly, but you know that she becomes the highest earning female athlete this country's ever produced. Yeah, and I, I'm not unashamed to say yeah, that. Yeah, I think we, that's a, you know, it's a way of to, valuing people. And we need to, and, and actually sadly, you know, when, when you talk to kids about sport, they tend to value it now on what people are earning. So if you're not earning anything in judo, it's not a sport they sort of, it's on their radar screen, although it's a fantastic sport. And, you know, you know, you go into the playground, they all know what Eden Hazard's earning a week. You know, they're even reading the, you know, the Deloitte reports on this sort of stuff. So it's an, it, it, young people do benchmark their sport on what people are earning in it. And we've got to get the athletes up there.